Yo, welcome into another edition of the Cyclone Fanatic Podcast. It is Tuesday, June 27th. What's going on, Jeff Woody? You're a liar. You're a liar, Jared. Okay, it's two, it's Thursday, June 22nd. Yeah. We're recording ahead of time. We're pre-recording these podcasts. I'm on vacation. Just started my vacation. Jeff's a couple days into vacation. Where are you at again? Uh, Switzerland. What's in Switzerland? Mountains, hiking, other pretty things. Is it Amsterdam in Switzerland? It is not. Oh. Amsterdam is a little bit farther north. Oh. Get your mind out of the gutter. Well, I just didn't know. Maybe you were going to go have some fun in the red light district. Yeah, that was just you, you know me. Yeah. Definitely just can't stay away from weed and hookers. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, everybody. We got, uh, so this is going to be the same format for the next two weeks. Uh, we, we're going to rank the big 12 basketball coaches today. Uh, and then next week we'll do the football coaches. Um, we're recording both of these ahead of time, just because we're going to be on vacation for these for these couple weeks. And, and normally, I would I, it, normally we wouldn't like the magic of media is you can record it whenever and air it whenever. And normally we wouldn't say anything as to that we are pre-recording something. Yeah. But events happened in the last ten to fourteen days that have caused coach rankings to be. Uh, a little bit of a topic that might change. Mm -hmm. So in the time between us recording this and this airing, things might be different. So if there is some uh, substantial fact that has occurred between Thursday and Tuesday, forgive us. We have, we, we wanted to let you just be aware. This is a little early. Yeah. If West Virginia has hired a new basketball coach by the time that this airs, just know that they've been exempted from the exercise. We have removed all consideration of the University of West Virginia from this. Theoretically, they come in at number 14 on the list so that no coaches out there can have any hard feelings about where they come in on the list because they're not in last. West Good Virginia job. is in last. Good job, guys. Worst best you can do is 13th out of 14th. It, it doesn't matter how many NCAA tournaments you've been to, how many conference titles you've won, because the coach at West Virginia right now has been to zero NCAA tournaments and has won zero conference titles. Also, never lost. Has never lost a game. He very well could have a very good case to be number one, in fact. Undefeated. Undefeated. Never Undefeated lost. at this point in his, uh, in his coaching career. Uh, before we get started, though, you want to tell us real quick about Goldfinch Speed? Yeah, so Goldfinch Speed, um, we actually had our first school reach out, which is great. Um, and one of the things that is interesting about this that I, I think I, that I really like about it is that when we're talking about trying to reach out to rural schools, we don't have to be there. I think that's sort of a misconception is that like you get a program, uh, someone from that program has to come out there. It's like we, don't, we we're not there. The point of coaching is that you feel, build relationships with your athletes and no one builds a relationship with your athlete better than the coaches and the, the, the PE teachers and the ones that are actually there with them. And so what we do is we provide the programming, we provide the infrastructure, um, the, the setup to actually get the kids motivated to train, and then some education to make sure that the coaches who are there know what's actually going on. But you are the ones that actually get to coach your kids. So you don't have to like, hope that the person you're bringing in is a quality person who cares about your kids. It's literally you get to, you're coaching it, uh, you're doing the the actual you're being there you're building the relationships with kids we just provide the the nuts and bolts on how to actually make that happen so that's the thing that we that's why we built this is because the relationships that rural coaches and players form that's a special thing and we don't want to screw with that we want to build on that this is the kind of thing that if like a pe teacher was out there look like they could build this into their curriculum 100 percent could yeah yeah 100 yeah, could yeah i was thinking about like when i was in high school i took advanced pe where it's like every you know most of the week you're lifting it's like monday wednesday friday you're lifting but then there's tuesday thursday and they'd always say oh yeah we're gonna do speed work on tuesday never did any speed never did any speed work and it's also but this, you, they could actually do some speed work get some good stuff and yeah. there is we there is a strength component if you want it's a it's uh our, we're the, the thing we're trying to make sure of is speed programming because uh, a lot of times the the people work really hard to build this strength program, but they just don't know where the speed component comes from. We also do have a strength component just in case that would be something that look, someone's looking to offload, but it's really, it's predominantly speed programming. And then the strength program is also there. And I think we do a pretty good job of that too. But yeah, it's the, the biggest thing I wanted to get on this week is just, we don't have to be there. It is you guys doing it. We provide you all the tools to be able to make it happen, but you're the one forming the relationships. How do they reach out to you? Uh, goldfinchspeed.com. And there's a contact us page and there's a couple signups if you wanted to start as whether it's an individual or as a team. There we go. All right, let's hop into the list. Uh, 
Do you want to go first? Or do you want me to go first? I mean, first, we already talked about it. It's uh, it's like, you know, when you go to uh, or NCAA football or Madden and it's like a undrafted free agent and yeah. they haven't got the roster updated with it. So it's just like a black outline. Yeah. And it just says like uh, running back number 26. Well, no, it is literally like NCAA football when you would start a new dynasty and it would say Neb coach. ISU coach. That's the name of the coaches. <laughs> like they didn't actually have names. It's uh-huh. just like uh, coach. Miami, you know, yeah, th- this is coach WVU. They, uh, they're on the list because they're, we have to, we have to make the math work. They're on the list because we want them to feel good. I mean, it, I would think we talked about this at, at length last week, but I would imagine that the, the, the thing that makes the most sense for the university to do is internally promote. If they have somebody who is a, of reasonable quality that was on that staff, because All the players know that coach. They've been recruited by that coaching staff. And that's the system they have in place. And they got like, I mean, again, they're probably going to be doing some summer exhibitions, but it's November is when the season starts. Like this is the middle of summer. You have what four or five months. It's not like it's no time, but it's also not a ton of time if you're going to completely come in and turn the system on its head. So I'm guessing this year, minimally, you internally promote and it's sort of like an audition Sort of like, uh, you know, Rodney Terry had Mm -hmm. where if you do a really good job, then maybe you get to keep the job. But this feels like that type of situation. So whoever assistant coach for West Virginia is that gets promoted to be the head coach, this feels like that spot. They do have someone on their staff. I can't remember his name, who was a head coach at a couple different places like at McNeese State or something like that. He'd been a head coach at a couple spots. So it's like they do have some head coaching experience on there on their staff, similar to what Rodney Terry was. So yeah. I, I think that that would probably be to me. It's like, just realistically, who's going to want the job at this point? You know, like I saw uh, Pat Kelsey at Charleston's name was tossed around. Well, he's probably already built his entire team at Charleston. Like, do you want to make that leap right now? Well, and you know? what are you committing to? Yeah. You know, like do you go leave Charleston, which was an NCAA tournament team. You leave Charleston and you go to West Virginia and then three of the guys that you transferred in are gone. And now you have to work your butt off to get a mid year recruit Mm -hmm. or mid year transfer to fill the rest of your roster, or you're going to be playing with like nine for the season. So it's not that appetizing a job because you don't know what you're committing to. You know, you're like, it's, but if it was, if it was at the normal time, it would be an appetizing job. It It would be a very good job. Absolutely. For sure. Because it is the show. Like it is, I mean, Pitt is a reasonable basketball program, but it's not the same level as West Virginia out there. Marshall is right. not the same level out there. So West Virginia is the show out there. This realistically isn't that much different than when Iowa State had to hire Steve Brum. That's very, true. very similar timing. That's true. Just obviously different circumstances, but still a good roster. Like whoever comes in is taking over a good roster. Everybody knew with that Iowa State team, whoever came in was taken, was going to pick up a good roster and start right, right away with a team that could win. I mean, you just had to keep them all together, but you know, some similarities there. So yeah, it feels like the most, it feels easier to promote from within, yeah. see how the year goes. And if the year goes well, then maybe you keep them on. And if the year goes poorly, then all right, that's it. At that point you start, you shake the etch a sketch and start over. All right. So my number 13, I've got Johnny Dawkins at UCF. Yeah, same. Okay. Uh, Johnny Dawkins has been to two NCAA tournaments. One is the head coach at Stanford. And then one, uh, since he's been at UCF, they went to, uh, the round of 32 and lost a close game to Duke the year that Duke had Zion Williamson when they had Taco Fall uh, and, and those guys. And Johnny Dawkins' son, I think, was on the team. It was a pretty good little team. But other than that, they have not had a ton of sustained success. Will probably be the unanimous pick to finish last in the league this year. And it's, I mean, it's it's hard because, <laughs> I mean, we're going to get through a few people here. You're like, who is this? But then when, yeah. we, get, when we get to like the top two thirds of this conference, you're like, oh, damn. He's number nine, Mm -hmm. you know, like it is a, this league is so deep. It's with coaches that I think that, I mean, sorry, Johnny Dawkins, you've done a fine job in most leagues. That's kind of middle of the pack. You get to a couple tournaments. You got a, you know, a guy like taco fall, who was a a really dominant player in the time that he was there. And you've, you've built at least something that's reasonably respectable, at least for until the last couple of years. But um, yeah, you're there's, this is just not a, This is not a conference to be okay. This reminds me of when TCU came in to the Big 12 with Trent Johnson. And Trent Johnson was in over his head quickly. You know, I think they went 0-18 too. It was like one of those things where uh, it 
they just did not have the talent necessary to be able to keep up in this league. And that that's what I anticipate will probably be the case for UCF, at least early. And you don't have the coaching chops necessarily yeah. to go up night after night when you're like, all right, how are we going to scheme against Scott Drew? How are we going to scheme against Bill Self? How are we going to scheme now against Jerome Tang? How are we going to scheme now against TJ Otzelberger? Like, you you have to go against this like murderer's row of people who have been to basically, I mean, the last three to five years, it's pretty much every one of these guys is a sweet 16. Half of them have an elite eight, like a third of them or a quarter of them have a final four and a few of them have a national championship. Like mm -hmm. this ain't exactly an easy, an easy lane to go in, not even talent excluded. It's just like, what are you going to do to match your, you're up by two with 35 seconds left. There's one of their key players has four fouls. What's the situation that's going to be run? You have to set up a defense for that. All right. Good luck. Yeah. All right. Uh, number 12, I've got Grant, Grant McCaslin from Texas Tech. Hey, I'm going to... My number 12 is Mark Pope. Okay. So he's the coach at BYU. So let's go with the stats on both of them because eventually they're going to show up. So stats on... Let's go with stats on McCaslin. I have, I have Mark Pope at 11. So, so it's pretty close. Okay. Uh, let's go with Mark Pope then. Both of them have been to one NCAA tournament. Mark Pope uh, did go to his one NCAA tournament as the head coach at BYU. And then Grant McCaslin was the head coach at North Texas when they went to the tournament. And then they won the NIT this year. So they've been postseason type of team, been good enough to go to the postseason, just haven't been in the NCAA tournament very many times. Which is why Mark Pope, when you talk about West Virginia and that job, <laughs> before, as we were kind of like loosely talking about this ratings, like we got, I got into a very anti-Mark Pope. Yeah. For absolutely no reason. Yeah. You except, didn't know who Mark Pope was till today. Except the fact that BYU is a school that actually does have a fairly strong athletics department if they are going to be led the right way. Yeah. Like it, it is similar to West Virginia is when West Virginia is West Virginia has the capacity to be really good because it is the show in town. It's the most important thing that's anywhere around. There's Utah and there's BYU. I mean, there's like, there's the jazz that's out there, but there's no other. I mean, it's, it's Iowa and Iowa state. You have the capacity to be the show. And when you underperform with a school that has resources, tradition, and a fan base, then that feels like it's a coaching failure. And so Grant McCaslin has been at North Texas. Like that is not the show. That is the 19th show in the Dallas Fort Worth area. But when you have all the resources that BYU has, you should probably be better than what they have been, which leads me. That's why Mark Pope is lower on the list. And Grant McCaslin, who has not coached at a power five level, he has just not been besmirched by coaching at a power five level and, and, and being average. Uh, since Mark Pope's been at BYU, they went 24 and eight in 2019, 20, uh, probably would have made the postseason. I'm sure that year that obviously was the COVID year, uh, went to the NCAA tournament, went 20 and seven in 2020, 21, 24 and 11 and 21, 22 went to the NIT and then finished fifth in the West coast conference. This last year went 17 and 14. And the West coast conference was good this year. I mean, they, that's, Gonzaga, St. but Mary's. I don't know if there's any excuse but for finishing for fifth? BYU to go seven and nine in the right in the in the West Coast Conference, right? You know, yeah, finishing finishing fifth in that. I mean, that's why like St. Mary's Gonzaga is going to win that conference most of the time. Yeah, but St. Mary's again also a great program, but there's no reason that you're going to be that you should be substantially behind them because you also have to play like I have a friend who works there, but like you got to play Loyola Marymount on like a Thursday. This guy's you know. won 70% of his games and 65% of his conference games. And would it shock you if they had a bad year and fired him? No. This, cause it, you're just talking about like when TCU came into the conference, like yeah. it's a, it's a different game, especially in this conference. This that you're, you are every night you're coming into a juggernaut that you don't have a night off where you can be like, Hey, we're going to, even if you're not going to rest, let's say they have a, you know, a stud point guard or a stud, a stud shooting guard and your stud shooting guard kind of turned his ankle and you have one tough game. And you say, all right, we're going to need you to, we're, we're going to grit through this one. And then on Thursday, we play Sister Mary's House of the Poor. And then we have a bye, or then we don't play again until next Thursday. We'll play you Thursday, but we're going to run sets away from where you're, where you, you know, against this guy, because you can still do it. And then he's going to get 13 minutes. There's no, there's none of that in the big 12. I mean, it, the, the Caleb Grill situation is sort of that example is you, you pull him off and the team instantly gets worse mm -hmm. and then it's worse for the kid. So like, because the conference is so challenging front to back. So it's a difference in how being able to manage that. So yeah, you can win 70% of your games, but when 70% of your games or when 100% or 90%, depending on how good UCF is when 90% of your games is against the top 70 of the RPI, like 
You're Again, fighting an uphill battle. Good luck. Yeah, yeah, good luck. Who do you have at 11? Uh, Wes Miller. Okay, I've got Wes Miller at 10. Uh, has not been to the NCAA tournament at Cincinnati. Uh, the last two years at Cincinnati, 18 and 15, 7 and 11 in the American Athletic Conference in year one, 23 and 13, 11 and 7 in year two, went to the NIT. Uh, does have two NCAA tournament appearances at UNC Greensboro and three other appearances in the postseason. Um, won about 60% of his games and a little over 60% of his games in conference when he was at Greensboro, but now right around 60% and 500 in the league at Cincinnati. I, I don't know that he's a younger coach. Like, I think this is one of the ones that's just, I don't know enough about the guy to feel like I could break him any higher than what I did. Yeah. Miller and McCaslin. It, it feels like these two guys are the, I mean, as far as this list is concerned, this very official list is concerned. It feels like they're in the same spot. Like mm -hmm. I have McCaslin at 10 and Miller at 11. And I, th I think any of these four, you could probably put them in any order and, right. I would, and, and you could convince me. And admittedly, we don't know a ton about them because you know, one of the things about the Big 12 that has been fun in the last few years is because it is round robin, you get to see everybody twice and right. you get to see what adjustments are getting made from a coach to player, a player to player and a coach to coach standpoint. They're like, you know how, hey, last time uh, when Iowa State played Kansas State, they, you know, whatever is they, Iowa State tried to trap Marquise Noel and they tried to get the ball out of his hands and he had a, you know, had a bad game. So we're going to set different higher, we're going to set screens higher to free him up to get a little bit more like the adjustment. You can see what the adjustments are because everybody plays everybody and every game is an important game. And so honestly, we, there is some of this where you're just going off statistics. We don't know enough about everybody else that these kind of new add-ins to the conference and, and McCaslin's not an add-in to the conference, just add into Texas tech. Um, who is also inheriting a great situation at Tech where should could be good, could be bad. I think this one for me, number nine, I heard you have a 10. Uh, McCasland. Okay, so number nine for me, I think was one that I is skewed considerably by the results of the last two years, but I got Porter Mosier. Same. Okay. Uh, the two years at Oklahoma, 34 and 33 overall, 12 and 24 in the Big 12. He had that four-year stretch at Loyola, obviously goes to the Final Four, went to the Sweet 16, uh, bookended by those two two appearances. But other than that, man, like his entire career, you know, he's basically a 500 or a little bit below 500 coach. Well, and this feels like it's just a, a bad fit. I think it was a bad fit. Like Oklahoma. Oklahoma is yeah. just, it feels like it's a bad fit for Porter Mosier because the way that when, because they're uh, Loyola at the time that they were doing, it was in the same conference as Drake in Northern Iowa. Mm -hmm. And that's a really... Um, tends to be other than like Drake, the last few years has, has sped this up considerably, but that tends to be a low possession, um, physical grinded out style, uh, where you're going to have skilled shooters. You're going to have a big man who can generally get into the post rebound decently facilitate, but, facilitate, but it's going to be a lot of guys because you are recruiting at a slightly lower levels. You're finding very specific guys like AJ green was is, is what played in Northern Iowa is that kind of the quintessential example. He's now, you know, he, he developed into a really good player, but he was a pretty much, he was, a, he's a reliable ball handler who is a spot up shooter who is underwhelmingly athletic. And like, that's the kind of guys that you're working with at that conference. So if you can get them to play defense really hard and you can get them to shoot consistently and play together and play together, then you're going to win that conference. And then when you have the confidence to do that, you get the tournament, anything can happen. Well, in this conference, uh, it's a fist fight. Yeah. Like, and that fist fight has to have a lot of talent and he's not been able to get his roster to a point where they can survive that fist fight consistently. Like the Groves brothers were, I mean, are incredibly talented and uh, I forget the, the name of the tried to guard. play Missouri Valley basketball in the right in the big, which 12. is the same thing that happened to Greg McDermott when he came to Iowa yeah. state. It's a yeah. very similar situation. It's that it doesn't quite fit with what the league needs it what you need to be in the league. So it just feels like this year is sort of a make or break. I don't think he's necessarily on a hot seat, but he's like, if somewhat, you have a poor year going into the sec, you don't exactly feel very good about it going into it. Yeah. Someone turned the turned the oven on yeah. his heat. His, his seat isn't hot yet, but like the cast iron pan is sort of starting to, it's just getting up to getting up bef just before you crack the egg in there. You finish ninth in the league and go five and 13 again. You're probably in trouble. Yeah. And I don't, I mean, if you're, if, if it's, if you're miss the tournament by a lot, then I, I mean, Porter Moser might all might be looking for a new position. Yeah. You probably can't go below 500 again and keep that job. If you're him, uh, number eight, I've got Mike Boynton at Oklahoma state, same one NCAA tournament, man, 
we didn't collaborate on this at all and we're somehow putting together basically the exact same ranking i feel like the top gets much more spicy because i mean really mike boynton being at eight <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dude, the amount what he what mike i love boynton, mike boynton what mike boynton did in a situation that he got put into it was oklahoma state because this is back i mean it feels like years ago with the adidas investigation yeah. of uh that somehow kansas escaped mm -hmm. somehow yeah uh but that oklahoma state they were removed from postseason contention could not play could not do it and he gets dropped in recruits and gets a, a team together and then they go out and are one probably i don't want to say the best defensive team in the conference but they're up there. They're up there. They're top three defense team in the conference. They're yeah. just inconsistent offensively. So it sort of felt, I would imagine, watching Oklahoma State was like watching a slightly more athletic Iowa State, where they're, they were bigger and longer, and they were more athletic, but they still had the same offensive inconsistency that they weren't really able to put points on the board. But he also was coming into a situation where, like, how do you recruit a guy if you can't, if, you, if they know that you cannot go to the postseason, and then how do you keep a whole team motivated knowing this season doesn't matter? Like that's the thing that they finished an, and they finished fifth in the league that year when they couldn't go to the tournament. That is an incredible coaching job. Yeah. And he's only been there for two years now. This will be his third. No, he, he's actually been there for six years, six years. Okay. This will wow. be his seventh season Man, missed that one. Yeah. But still like the, the, the fact that he has was able to keep that group together. Like that's nuts. Yeah. Mike Boynton's a good coach. I, in his career, 107 and 90 at Oklahoma state, 47 and 61 in the league, gone eight and 10, eight and 10, 11 and seven, the last three years in the league. I mean, it, Mike Boyne's a good coach. Yeah. And a lot of times I don't feel like they've been taking a team that is necessarily at the same talent level as everybody else. And they've been pretty competitive. I think consistently. I, I wonder what they're going to do. Cause like, uh, Musa Cisse was one of the he, most, he left, yeah. I know what he was one of the most dynamic defenders, but he also had a pretty limited offensive skill set. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, is it Boone was the other big Caleb man? Boone. Yeah. He, and he's gone too. So both of those guys, the, you're, I would imagine you're building your roster. When you have two guys that are seven foot and can jump out of the gym like that, you're building your entire roster around that. Now that both of them are gone, Oklahoma state's probably going to look totally different. Yeah. They lost Avery Anderson and Bryce Thompson as well in their backcourt. So, I mean, that's going to be a whole new team. Yeah. Basically. It'll be, it'll be totally different. Yeah. That they'll probably be picked pretty low in the league compared to the other teams that have been in the league before. But would you be surprised if they like finished fourth? No, I mean, I, they could very well finish in the middle of the league, you know, but that's, I feel like they overperform or they usually overperform what the expectation level is going into the season. Cause, but I also never have gone into a year except for maybe that year they had Cade Cunningham and it's like, oh man, Oklahoma state's can, you know, is a contender for the top half of the league. Like they usually just kind of end up in that area. Yeah. They're they're It's an unsexy version of like, oh, okay. Well, Oklahoma state's won eight games this year. Right. And if they win one more game last year, they probably make the tournament. Well, they, I honestly think they probably still could have, you yeah. know, it was just like, but if they went nine to nine, they probably get in. Yeah. They went eight and 10. Yeah. The selection committee didn't pick them, but they probably, especially as the way they're, or by the way, they were playing in the back half of the season. Like, didn't they win like four or five in a row, like at, towards in the, not necessarily the very end of the season, like a reasonable portion of towards the end of the year. I mean, they were as they were to me, if I recall, they were as hot of a team in the big 12, because at one point they were like, it was them and Texas tech were way down at the bottom of the conference then reeled off like a substantial winning streak in the mm -hmm. big 12 when everyone's playing round robin that was that was impressive all right number seven i've got rodney terry at texas uh in his career two ncaa tournament bursts one uh big 12 tournament championship obviously interesting or different kind of situation that he walked into a year ago 22 and 8 12 and 6 in the big 12 finished second in the league went to the elite eight like i mentioned won the big 12 tournament prior to that uh was the head coach at utep won 43% of his games, 36% of the games in, in conference, went to the NCAA tournament one year at Fresno State uh, when he was the head coach there prior to that. Uh, Roddy Terry very, mel very well may be a top half of the, I mean, I guess he is top half of the league coach in my list here, but like he very well could be a top five coach in the league, but I just don't feel like I know enough about him and haven't seen him had to build his own team. And when he did have to build his own team, the success obviously wasn't there. Yeah, this is a prove it. It feels like uh, you're playing horse. In the backyard against your brother mm -hmm. and he's like all right off the house bank shot from on top of the steps and he makes it you go okay prove it mm -hmm. one more time prove it now maybe he's that good of a shooter i don't know maybe he's that can can consistently hit that again but it doesn't feel like this is there's not enough track record to be again 
this is a com- death by comparison. Is it like you look at the rest of the people on the list? Right. It's nuts. So there's just not been enough track record of success for this ranking to be for him to be ranked higher on the list. And when you talk about like people who have succeeded, so let's like Grant McCasland again to bring him up again. He went to the NCAA tournament with North Texas. The resources that North Texas have very small. Now, granted, you're recruiting in the DFW area, so it's a little bit different. You have something to pull from. Rodney Terry is working with Texas's entire big swing and bat of an athletic department. Right. So when you're trying to get people to recruit or come to you or come to your team or whatever, you have a lot more at your disposal to use, which sort of it's a double edged sword. Like you have more to it, but there's also more expectations that you are good. So now if Texas, let's say next year, I doubt it happens that they fall off too far just by talent alone. But let's say that they if they finish ninth in the conference. Even if that, I mean, it's good. It's a good team. They'll probably make the tournament. Eight, eighth or ninth. Eighth probably makes the tournament. I don't know if ninth does. You're flirting with it. So let's say they make the tournament, but they're like an 11 seed. Mm-hmm. Roddy Terry is probably already on the hot seat. Yeah. From going from elite eight to, a, because the expectations are higher in Texas. So I don't know that if there's, you just have more that you have to do more to, than just that one season to prove it. Who do you have at seven? Let's leave that for after the break. Okay. We'll take a quick break. Uh, and then when we come back, we'll uh, we'll get through the rest of these rankings. All right, welcome back in here on the Cyclone Fanatic Podcast Network. Uh, really quick, before we get to the rest of the rankings, I want to tell you guys about Hinterland Music Festival coming up August 4th through the 6th down just south of Des Moines in St. Charles, Iowa. Uh, Bonnie Vare, Zach Bryan, Maggie Rogers. Uh, who could forget Cuckoo the Kangaroo? Cuckoo the Kangaroo, hey. Shout out Cuckoo the Kangaroo. Cuckoo the Kangaroo at the chil- at the children's area uh, coming up if anybody wants to take their kids out there. Uh, music and camping passes are on sale right now at hinterlandiowa.com. Uh, Going to be three great days of, of great acts and uh, should be a lot of fun down there in St. Charles, just south of Des Moines, August 4th through the 6th. I, I, every, again, every, I just said it last year. Every year, there's another commitment that happens at the same time, and I have to pick one or the other, and it's always a tough choice. What did you say you have going on this year? Uh, the CrossFit Games. Oh, I'm yeah, that's a, right. That's right. As a, as a gym owner, and it's like the World Championships and the biggest uh, professional career fair at yeah. the same time for a gym owner. So I'm going to that. So it's kind of, it just happens to be at the same time. But every single year, the Hinterland lineup is nuts. Yeah. And it's right down the alley of music that I like. Just can't go. The only thing that would make it better is if Kendrick Lamar was there. I think that's a different vibe. I think it's a little bit of a different vibe. I'm just saying, if Kendrick Lamar showed up at Hinterland, I think that that would be huge news. <laughs> that would be everyone. I think everybody at Hinterland would be happy. Everyone's just kind of sitting in a lawn chair vibe, and all of a sudden, every time I'm in the streets, I, yeah, 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 yeah. And then it just, he just comes out with Zach Bryan. <laughs> He's Bony Bear. Yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, Kendrick Lamar's on the. Uh, right on the after stage. we finish Holocene, we're going to bring on uh, one of my friends, uh, Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> Come on up, Kendrick. I <laughs> uh, need to tell you too about our friends at Gravitate Coworking, uh, all of their great spaces uh, in downtown Des Moines. They've got their location in the East Village, uh, Midtown in Windsor Heights, and then of course their spot out in Jefferson. Uh, if you're looking for a place, you need to get out of your house, you need to get away from your kids, just want to find somewhere that you can uh, work with other you know, great people that are uh, are trying to get out of their houses and avoid their kids too. <laughs> Other people who are trying to escape their families. I, that sounds way more negative than it is. Yeah, check out gravitatecoworking.com. Uh, like I said, they've got four great locations in downtown Des Moines, the East Village, Midtown Des Moines, and in Jefferson. All right, let's get to the top six now of these rankings here, uh, our Big 12 men's basketball coach rankings. Uh, at number six, I have Jerome Tang. Same. Where, basically from nine to, from 10 to six, been exactly the same but this for me it's the same thing as rodney terry like prove it yeah you have you had two first team all conference players on your roster last year is that coaching or is that just those two guys being really really good you know like and can uh uh and the reality is that they lucked into the keontae johnson situation yeah frankly yeah well and I mean, marquise Noel, when you have a a dynamic unbelievable point guard that makes the entire roster substantially better. Mm-hmm. And Marquise Noel was the best point guard in the country last year. Full stop. So when you have when you don't have that now, what do you got? Yeah. 26 and 10 in year one at Kansas State, 11 and 7 in the league, finished third, went to the Elite Eight. Uh, obviously a, a really strong team, a coach that made 
uh, was the national coach of the year, big 12 coach of the year, AP big 12 coach of the year. I mean, he was, he was everywhere. Uh, but obviously a big year coming up for him in year two. Uh, number five, I have TJ Otzelberger. I got Jamie Dixon. Okay. At number five. Okay. I think for TJ four NCAA tournaments in his career, back to back years going to the, to the NCAA tournament since taking over at Iowa state, there's the recruiting that you think about how well he's recruited compared to the rest of the league is in a, at an elite level at this point. Uh, and then his teams consistently have out, have overperformed what their expectation levels are. So I, I think that that's what puts him at number five for me. Well, and I think with the reason why Jamie five or uh, Jamie Dixon's a five and I got TJ at four. The I, have, reason, I have Jamie at four. So we're so reversed. flip. I mean, either one flipping those. And, well, the thing is, so Jamie Dixon has a really long track record of success because yeah. when he was at Pitt, they were really good. Now he's at TCU, TCU and yeah. they're a lot better. I mean, taking TCU from where they were to where they are now. I would imagine that TCU is going to be picked in the top half of the conference next year. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have them, but there's still something with Jamie Dixon that like something always happens towards the end of the season, whether it's an injury or uh, like your boy, big Eddie, uh, yeah. something happens towards the end of the year, which has forced them not to be able to live up to the potential that they actually have, which might be shit luck. But it also might be something as far as like whether it's load management or uh, roster management as far as like personalities and stuff like that. And so it's one of those things that like if this were to be done five years ago, then does Jamie, uh, Jamie Dixon still really high on the list, but just where does that fall? So I don't know. It feels like TCU per expectations last year sort of underperformed. But again, that's because the conference is so damn hard. And you, when you lose Mike Miles for most of the conference year, it's also hard to be at the same level when you have probably arguably the best player in the conference not playing. Are we overvaluing TJ? I don't think so. I mean, because honestly, if you think about it, like so year one, we all know like the miracle story yeah. that TJ went from ass to NCAA tournament team, sweet 16 team. But then to go from that team, which was could have been a flash in the pan and go back again to the NCAA tournament. Now, granted, that was as hard. I mean, it was it was that game and the UAB game have been the two worst NCAA tournament games that I have watched as a human being. Uh, but in your time as a human, in my time as a human, prior to that, who knows, man? Who knows? Um, but other than that, I mean, that was a really bad execution in the tournament. But with what the roster had and what the roster was based on the Tyrese Hunter thing, like having to rebound from that. And then you springboard that going forward. I mean, kind of in the middle is where a lot of the commitments were. And then you load up the roster to be for the first time, not on the back foot, you know, like, yeah. so he has played, he has been coaching reactively with what the roster has been for the last two seasons and still managed to get the NCAA tournament. And the other thing that I think the reason why TJ, I put him higher on the list is when you look at the way that he has coached each one of his teams, it has been to what the team needs it to be. And then he has mesh. He has fit himself around that where at South Dakota state, you got Mike Dom, who is, I mean, for, for someone, for no one who, for people who didn't see it, it's like Nikola Jokic in college. Like it's that style play where he's the best shooter. He's the best passer. He's the best rebounder on the floor. He just happens to play center and he's a big, tall, sort of unathletic white guy. Like that's basically, so it's Nikola Jokic in college. Well, he built the roster that they were going to outshoot you with Mike Dom at center. Well, fast forward, go through the UNLV stint. You come to Iowa State. You don't have Mike Dom. Yeah. You don't. I mean, you have George Condit, who's your center. You got Bob Jones. And yeah. you have those two guys as a center. And so you have to completely scrap the way you play in that sense. Now, granted, it's there's a couple different ways in between there. But then you build this roster as absolutely just tough, tenacious, I mean, fist fight defense and score enough in transition that you're going to be able to get a win. And then you think that you're going to be able to do that. You have, you get a transfer in Williams, you have Tyrese Hunter, you think you're going to have this guard, uh, th these back, this backcourt that you could actually make something work. Then Tyrese leaves and Williams gets hurt and you got to scrap it again, yeah. completely redo your style of play, go back to sort of what you did last year, but you know, you have to have a different shooter because Isaiah Brockington's not there and then you have to redo it again. So now this will be the first time, hopefully that he will be able to coach the team in a way that he has set the team up to be coached and he still went to the NCAA tournament back to back years. Like that's why I don't think we're necessarily overvaluing TJ. Fair. 
Jamie Dixon and I gave him the he- the the edge just on longevity. 14 NCAA tournaments, two Big East titles when he was at Pittsburgh, and he walked into such a dumpster fire situation. I mean, that program was so far behind everybody else in the league, and he's won 60 percent of his games and has been to the tournament three times. And he sort of feels because how many years has he been there now? Because this is up to about what, eight or nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, this will be year year eight. So this is now, I mean, digging out of the dumpster fire. And last year, and then Mike Miles gets hurt and Eddie Lampkin, mm-hmm. you know, does whatever happened to Eddie Lampkin. Uh, so last year they kind of had the roster built to where, you know, we're talking about with TJ, this upcoming season is finally a roster that he has been able to put together himself for what he wants. Last year felt like the first year that Jamie Dixon had that, and then Mike Miles gets hurt. So coming into this season, it's probably going to be about the same where he's finally got a roster. They have a very good team. They have a very good team. I think they have a very good team. He's finally got a roster that he has and the facilities are there and the infrastructure is there and the coaching staff is stable and everything's finally on the level where this year will be sort of when he's finally been able to, to switch from like startup CEO to now fortune 500 CEO. And like that, that the difference in, scrapping versus like actually going out and doing it. Do you know Jameer Nelson Jr. is going to play for the Frogs this year? Man, Jameer Nelson Jr. is in college. He is. He's actually like a senior. Cool. Yeah. Average, that make you, average 20 a game last year at Delaware. That make you feel old? It it does, in <laughs> fact. Make me feel old uh, to know that Jameer Nelson Jr. is a and, senior in college. And uh, LeBron James' kid. Yeah. Uh, going to be in college at UCL or UCLA or saw, USC, excuse me. USC, I saw Jermaine USC. O'Neal Jr.'s kid is going to be. Oh, in my college God. Soon. Jermaine O'Neal. Yeah. Pacer legend Jermaine O'Neal. Or not Jermaine O'Neal. J- Jermaine O'Neal Jr. will be in yeah. college. Not Jermaine O'Neal Jr.'s son. Uh, <laughs> Jermaine, O'Neal. Jermaine O'Neal the third. The third. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Man, that would make you feel old if you get Jermaine O'Neal in the NBA in the NBA 2000, what, five? And yeah. is now a grandfather who's got a kid in college. Yeah. That feels a little premature. But yeah, Jermaine O'Neal, man. NBA Pacer legend, Jermaine O'Neal. I want to know when, uh, or I saw Derek Rose's kid balling out the other day. Dude, it's uh, every day I see a new, it's like, we're like six years out from the entire league just being the sons of the players that we watched while we were growing up. I and bet then, Ben Wallace has a kid and that kid's probably a, a, a freaking demon too. What if Ben Wallace's kid was born with a fro? Would it shock you? No. And a headband on. <laughs> he comes out with a headband and a fro. It's the, the doctors in the, like in delivery and he has to like push the fluff around before he actually gets the kid, the yeah. kid out. Yeah. All right. At number three on my list, I have Kelvin Sampson at Houston, two final fours, uh, 18 NCAA tournament appearances. I mean, he's one of the best coaches in the country. How wild is it that Kelvin Sampson, again, I have Kelvin Sampson at three. Like why is, how wild is it that Kelvin Sampson is at three? Yeah. That is nuts. Basically because he hasn't won a national title. That's like the only thing missing from his resume. And even if he had, uh, he hasn't won a, a national title in the last five years. Yeah. You know, like it, the Kelvin Sampson's one of those guys where, cause he was uh, oh, brain fart. Where was he at before? Was oh, it, he was at Indiana uh, and, and then Oklahoma before that. Okay. He was at Oklahoma for a long time. Before yeah. That. And uh, like, has been successful at every single stop. Yeah. He and was going to be successful at Indiana too, before he got fired for NCAA stuff. So now he's at Houston and Houston feels like, because that like the five slam pajama stuff, like they, they have a basketball history and they're going to fit They're there to me, them and Cincinnati are easily the best, most natural mm-hmm. nestled in fits. Uh, C- Cincinnati more for football and Houston more for basketball. Like yeah. when, if you said Houston's in the big 12, you don't go, wait, what? Versus when you say like UCF is in the big 12, you're like, hold on for real. So it feels like they're the most natural fit. And then Kelvin Sampson as, I mean, just as consistent and longevity as he has had I mean, they're they were a few games away from winning the national championship this year. Yeah. A few, a, a, a really a pulled hamstring away mm-hmm. because their starting point guard. They're good. Marcus Sasser, the Marcus, team was that good. Yeah. And yeah. he just pulled his hamstring and he was again, sort of, sort of, if you didn't see it or didn't like think, back to Marquise Noel, if Marquise Noel's not on Kansas state or isn't at full strength to Kansas state, what is Kansas state like? Sort of like what Houston was yep. without Marcus Sasser. And they're going to have a very good team in year one in the big 12. Uh, number two, Scott drew at Baylor. My head you coach did it. My head coach. You did it. You put, you put drew at number two. Yeah, I course. also did. Of course. What kind of idiot is not putting <laughs> Scott drew at number two, uh, one national title, one final four, two big 12 regular season titles, 11 NCAA tournament appearances, quite literally brought the program back from the dead 
uh, from a dead guy. Yeah, from a from a dead guy. The team literally couldn't play non conference games his first year, uh, and then he like he built the program from nothing basically, and has turned it into a consistent national power, a top ten team on an annual basis. And he's another guy you talk about TJ matching the uh, matching the the play to the talent. Mm-hmm. He's another guy that does the same thing. Like last year, they were exceptionally I don't want to say guard heavy in a bad way. Three three of the best guards in America. They just happened to be on the same roster. And that is what they built it around. They were just, they were, they didn't have a lot of front court depth. Uh, Backtrack to when they won the national title. They've got like six guys that are 6'10 or better. Yeah. Super athletic. While still having phenomenal guards. While still having phenomenal guards. But you have, uh, he is, or even back even further when, uh, like back when it was like hoy ball. Yeah. And you're playing the one, three, one zone because they're just playing. Right. Jonathan Motley, Isaiah Austin, those guys. And you're doing the one, three, one. And it's a, a super confusing defense to try and play against because of the length that they have. And they're trying to muddy the game up and they're trying to do that. Well, fast forward to last year and they're playing, they're trying to outshoot you. They're playing hoy ball against this. And so he's a guy that can succeed in any different style. And he's, he just, he seems also like if you go to, a, if you were to go to a restaurant, he would, he, he would ask for the least amount of spice on any food dish that he ordered. Like, can you imagine Scott drew eating spicy food? Uh, I want buffalo wings, but can you hold the buffalo? Hey, yeah. Um, can I just get the? Uh, can I just get some barbecue sauce on that and a, just a, an iced tea unsweetened, please? That's and that's what he's going to order out of Buffalo Wild Wings. It's an iced tea unsweet and the least spicy wings. Yeah, he's going to look at the little bottle, you know, that's got the heat on it, and he's going to order the one in the green. <laughs> he's going to go. Oh, I don't know if I can handle that. Who boy. That feels like it's going to be a little spicy. I don't want. It's like I lemon think, pepper. I don't think I can handle that. I'll just take the little one. Thank you, ma'am. What a good guy Scott Drew is. All right, number one, there is no other guy that can be in consideration for number one. It's Bill Self at Kansas. Two national titles, four Final Fours, um, 17 Big 12 titles. I don't know 17. how many I don't know how many NCAA tournaments he's been to. A lot, all of them. Oh, just just every, assume. Every Big 12 title. Yeah, just assume he's been to every NCAA tournament. I mean, he's the best coach in college basketball. Clearly the best coach in, in the Big 12. Yeah, it, it's pretty anticlimactic. And like as much as you want to hate it, like... Tell me a time when Kansas has been underprepared yeah. or plays not hard. Yeah. You know, like. Or is underperformed. Or is underperformed. Like, there have been teams like a bad year for Kansas is like tied for first in the league and getting beat in the second round of the Big 12 tournament. Like, yeah. that's a bad year for Kansas. And that all comes down, you know, you, we, you look at Duke and North Carolina and Coach K leaves and you know, as Shire is the name yeah, of the coach. Like Shire, Shire, yeah. Shire is a good coach and they got to the tournament, but like they didn't, they didn't dominate right. like they did always with Shashevsky and North Carolina. You got to manage those personalities. Like once you have expectations, you have to manage those expectations. And like Bill self's done that every freaking year, as much as it is as painful as it is sometimes that Kansas is always good. You just assume that Kansas is always good. And that's, it's exclusive, not exclusively. It is largely due yeah. to Bill Self. Yeah, he's the best coach in college basketball. I mean, when he deci- when he decides to walk away, like it doesn't matter. They could get any coach in the country, and it'd be a downgrade. And it will be a downgrade because there just is, there's no one else that I think is on his level. Well, and it feels like we talked about the Steelers a couple episodes ago. This feels like the Steelers because didn't he take over from Larry Brown, or did he take over? There's one person in between. He took over for Roy Williams. Roy Williams, who was taking over for Larry, Larry Brown. Brown. So like this is the Steelers of college basketball. Well, you realize that Kansas has had like, I think they've had seven basketball coaches in history in 80 years or whatever it is. More hundred something. Yeah. It's like starting with literally the man who invented the game. Damn history. Yeah. Damn history. But yeah, I mean like if you think about, yeah, Larry Brown to Roy Williams to Bill Self is what they've had back to back to back. (laughs) Who's filling, who's filling in? Who's the next coach at Kansas when Bill Self retires? I feel like we don't even know him yet. Like, we don't even know who the guy is. Also, I wonder what, I would imagine his health situation has been rectified, but that also sort of goes, I mean, his assistant did a fine job, but they got bounced earlier in the tournament than they normally would have uh, without Bill Self there. I wonder if that has anything, if his health will have anything to do with longevity, where if that, if that continues, I would imagine like his wife and kids would be like, dad. I know you love this, but you're going to have a heart attack on the sidelines. Yeah. Can we at least like, you know, buy a lake house and 
hang out, hang out a little bit. Yeah. So I would imagine if, depending on what that health situation is, that feels like a, that would be the thing that would push him out sooner. But if his health situation is rectified, he's going to coach till he's 95. I might get killed for this, but hang like just spending an afternoon with Bill Self would be on the bucket list. He does seem like he would actually be a pretty pleasant person. Yeah. I think that just hanging out with him for a day would be cool. Cause you just know, he's just going to talk ball all the time. I imagine that's all he thinks about is you, ball. You know, when uh, like you have a, a, a person like Sage kind of does it where like to them, he's like, so I was, you know, I ran into Ricky Williams the other day and like casually yeah. saying that like this thing that happened to this other person, you're like, holy shit, you just, you just, oh, yeah. just like, dropped it. You ran into Ricky Williams. I ran Bill, into Paul Pierce the other day. Yeah. Uh, Bill Self would be, got it to be the same thing. Like, yeah, so we were in practice, you know, and Paul Pierce was just trying, he was being such a dickhead in the practice. I was like, wait, 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 wait. Just like casually mentioning Paul Pierce. Yeah. Like it's nothing. Whoever. Yeah, any of those guys. Lots of good players that have played for Bill Self. All right, Aiden, uh, what do you think of our rankings? TJ is way too low. Where would, what do you mean? I have him at four. Behind have, five. Behind Bill Self. Kelvin Sampson and Scott Drew. That's why I have TJ Ott's behind. This is why you don't get a microphone the whole time. I had my rankings based on biceps. Okay. That's actually, that's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, the, the biceps, who would come in second in the bicep competition? I don't, I don't know much on the rest of the, the uh, Johnny Dawkins, Mark Pope, Wes Miller, Grant McCaslin, but Porter Mosher's a fit dude. He was wearing tight shirts, though. Yeah, he's wearing, a, he's wearing an extra large, needs a large, or a medium. Uh, I mean, I would take Mike Boynton, like he's one of another younger guy. Yeah. If we're talking about fights here. Oh, and now this is just who's going to win in a fight. Well, I mean, I guess I assumed that that was what the biceps really meant. Was like, Scott yeah. Drew's the bottom of that list. Absolute bottom of the list. Scott Drew would try to be the peacemaker, even though everyone else is trying to he's fight. Getting, he's getting punched in the face and he's like, guys, hey, y'all, ouch. Hey, y'all don't have, ouch. Y'all don't have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, don't, I would love to. This is enough to turn into UFC, UFC fight rankings. Uh, Scott Drew, the very bottom of the list. Bill Self next to bottom. Bill Self and Kelvin Sampson, not going to do well in a fight. Jamie Dixon, probably also not going to do, do well in well a fight. fight. Older guy. Uh, Porter Moser, again, reasonably fit dude. Got decent reach. Uh, TJ's going to win that 10 times out of 10. Jerome Tang would be too nice for the UFC octagon as well. Well, Drat, Dagnabbit. Yeah. There's no profanity in, in the Jerome Tang's. Court. yeah no which no. is wild to me no it's absolutely wild no none whatsoever all uh, right yeah i'm sure that, that i'm sure there's no cursing whatsoever <laughs> out there on the basketball get, court when jerome get, tang's involved i'm you sure get, and you get a group of because Mar again marquise noel's from new york like you get a bunch a new yorker in a room and have him play a competitive thing and tell him not to swear yeah it's like keontae johnson's like from florida yeah good luck yeah good luck good luck drat you should drat uh, ah shoot dag nabbit all right, we'll talk to you guys again next week. We'll have our Big 12 football rankings coming out. Uh, we'll talk to you guys again then. Peace.